Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the VCU Department of Internal Medicine, Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Christian Bergman. I'm the Medical Director, Grand Rounds Coordinator. We also have um, with us today, Thomas Bryan, who's our uh, Grand Rounds Coordinator, uh, as well as our uh, presenters today, uh, which we'll get to in one minute. Um, Quick uh, comments, uh, as always, uh, we are still in a virtual environment until next fall. Um, you all will see more information about that, uh, including a survey that will be uh, sent around about ways to improve grand rounds for next year. So uh, that survey will be open for the next 30 days. Uh, we will put a link to the survey in the chat. And you will also receive it through some emails, encourage people to provide feedback. For today's session, uh, you also have the option of a Q&A session, so you can, um, uh, there are three ways to ask questions. We'll hold the questions generally until the end, but you can ask to unmute chat in the chat box or use the Q&A function. We will record the session and everything will be available on the website. So uh, today is another one of these exciting grand rounds. It's a clinical pathological conference um, and we have a moderator with us, Niha, is one of our internal medicine chief residents. Um, and we have a presenter, Dr. Christina Vito, um, which I'll introduce in a minute. And then we have a secret case expert, uh, which will be revealed about halfway through. Uh, will help us guide through some of the clinical decision and the differential diagnosis. So this is super exciting. These conferences are always um, uh, well liked by many people. So thank you all for joining us. So uh, Dr. Christina Vito is currently assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine with a joint appointment in internal medicine. She received her medical degree from VCU and completed a combined residency in emergency medicine and internal medicine here at VCU. She's currently the co-director of the competency-based graduation program here at VCU. She serves as faculty instructor in the School of Medicine for the practice of clinical medicine course, as well as a project heart faculty lead. Additionally, she is a preceptor for medical students in the practice of clinical medicine. And for those of you not familiar with that, that's M1 and M2 students uh, as they're getting ready for their clinical year in M3. So really important uh, in undergraduate medical education. She serves as a physician advisor in the Department of Care Coordination and Utilization Management. And is also the chair of the VCU Emergency Medicine search committee. Uh, welcome, Dr. Vito, and thanks for being here uh, with us. So, um, I'm really excited about today's conference. A case was circulated around. Uh, if you need a link to that or an email, please let us know so you can follow along. But uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Niha to help uh, introduce the case and walk us through the next steps. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. All right, let me share my screen and get started. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Neha, and I'm one of the internal medicine chief residents. I'm really excited to be here to present our last CPC of the year. And I wanted to, again, thank Dr. Vito for being here. With that, we'll get started. So kind of like what Dr. Bergman was saying, this is a format. I'll introduce us to the case, which should take about five minutes. Then I'll hand it over to Dr. Vito, who will go through the, just the case and her dissection of it, which should take about 30 or so minutes. Then our secret content expert will be revealed and we'll have a discussion for about 10 or so minutes, followed by a Q&A for any remaining time. The objective of our CPC, like CPCs in the past, is to identify key components in the patient's presentation. What is relevant in our history and our physical exam, in our labs and in our imaging? But let's generate a differential diagnosis, system-based, start thoughtfully broad, and then narrow down and then use evidence-based medicine to support diagnostic approach and use critical thinking throughout the process. So let's get started. The patient is a 60-year-old man with a medical history significant for an orthotopic heart transplant four months prior to his presentation. He presents to the emergency room with complaints of subacute muscle pain and multiple masses on his back. He was in his usual state of health until about three weeks ago when he started to notice a progressive mass on the back. He said it was painful, but denied any sort of drainage. With time, he noted more masses present on his back, as well as one on his right thigh. He also noted significant myalgias that also began three weeks ago. 
His pain was initially felt all over his body, but more recently was localized to his lower extremities. He described it as an aching pain, but progressively worsening to the point where he was unable to ambulate properly and noted that he was shuffling to move around. His symptoms began after a recent hunting trip and became concerned when his symptoms progressively worsened. He notes a stable cough, chills, and a recent fever to 101.7. For further review of systems, it's positive for fever, chills, change in activity and fatigue, a cough, constipation, back pain, myalgias, weakness, and positive for an immunocompromised state given his recent transplant. To round out his history, so he has this history of ischemic cardiomyopathy, now status post heart transplant, atrial fibrillation, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, renal cell carcinoma. For surgical history, beyond his heart transplant, he also had a left nephrectomy. For family history, it was significant for both hypertension and heart failure in his parents, as well as diabetes. For his social history, so he denies any current tobacco, illicit, or current alcohol use. He is married and monogamous with his wife. He has nine dogs, dewormed every six months, one horse, and previously had a chicken who is now deceased. He hunts frequently, but has not killed nor skinned any animal since his transplant. He will eat rabbit, squirrels, and deer, but boils the meat prior. He's never been incarcerated or homeless and has never traveled outside of Virginia. For his medications, he's currently on apixaban, atovaquone, defetilide, losartan, mycophenolate, nifedipine, rosuvastatin, tacrolimus, and valgancyclovir. His only, only allergy is to lisinopril, which has caused angioedema in the past. For his physical exam, upon presentation, he was febrile to 38.1. Blood pressure was 118 over 87. Heart rate was 100. He was satting well on room air. He appeared uncomfortable, but not toxic. His HEENT exam was normal. His neck was supple with no JVD, bruise, or thyromegaly. His, he had no cervical, submandibular, axillary, or inguinal lymphadenopathy. He was tachycardic, but with a regular rhythm, no new murmurs. He had good pulses and no lower extremity edema. His lungs were normal. His abdominal exam was also normal. His musculoskeletal exam was pertinent for multiple tender subcutaneous nodules involving the back and the right thigh. There was a 12 by six centimeter slightly warm mass on the right paraspinal area. There was also a tender mass on the back, which was four centimeters in diameter. The right glute was tender to palpation as was his right thigh, which also had a palpable mass present. His neuro exam was normal as was his skin and psych exam. For his lab data, so his BMP upon admission showed a sodium of 133, potassium of 4.5, chloride of 100, BUN of 23, a creatinine of 1.21, and a glucose of 227. Calcium was 9.9, .9, mag was 1.7, and his phos was 4.6. His CBC showed a white count of 6.8, hemoglobin of 10.5, and platelets of 338. His ESR was elevated to 120. His CRP was also elevated to 21.4. His fungitel was 38, aspergillus antigen was 0.04. His AFB culture did not show mycobacterial tuberculosis. His quantiferon TB gold was also negative. His cryptococcal antigen, histoplasma antigen, blastomyces antigen were all negative. His respiratory culture showed, uh, was suggestive of respiratory flora and his respiratory pathogen panel was also negative. And he had two sets of blood cultures which were all negative. And lastly, for his imaging. So his CT chest with IV contrast showed a heterogeneous mass in the posterior left paraspinal musculature. He also had a lobulated opacity in the apical posterior segment of the left upper lobe with that measuring 5.2 by 4.7 by 5.4. It had a heterogeneous attenuation, including areas of apparent cavitation along the anterior and medial aspects of that area of abnormality. His CT abdomen pelvis with IV contrast showed fluid collection with septation noted in the right gluteus medius muscle, mildly complex fluid collection along the paraspinal muscles. He also had a fluid collection in the upper anterior lateral abdominal wall musculature, possibly involving the most anterior superior aspect of the transversus abdominis muscle. And lastly, he had a CT head with IV contrast, which showed a left cerebellar peripherally enhancing lesion with surrounding edema. So with all of that information, I will now, my pleasure, to pass it over to Dr. Vito to go ahead and dissect the case. Thank you.
Thank you all so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. As mentioned um, previously, I do work both in the emergency uh, department as well as I've had the opportunity to work on the teaching wards this year, which was a really wonderful experience um, and fun to be on the other side of it after doing my training here. All right, so. All right. So as I go through, I'm just going to touch on the pertinent positives, pertinent negatives as we go through each component of the information that was given to me. So in green is our pertinent positives and red will be our pertinent negatives. Um, so here, I think as we begin the HPI dissection, clearly what's very important here is he, he's a recent heart transplant recipient four months ago. He's presenting with this subacute muscle pain and masses on his back. Um, that started three weeks ago. He has these myalgias um, diffusely. Um, they do note this difficulty with ambulation. Um, and this all started after a hunting trip, which um, will begin to formulate a few differentials as well. Um, he does note this stable cock. We don't know how long it's been present. I would presume maybe prior to the onset of the muscle masses based on it being stable, um, but we don't know for how long. Um, but the fever of 101.7 at home is also very important. Now the emergency medicine doctor and me would just stop right here and admit the patient and we could be done with this. But of course, the internal medicine side of me is excited to continue on and figure out what caused all this. So we will proceed. So his review of systems, um, pertinent positives was obviously the fevers, the chills, um, the fatigue. Um, for his ENT, he does not have any mouth ulcers and I'll jump down to the GU or genital uh, lesions. Um, so some things, um, viral things notably, um, I'm feeling less confident about. He has this cough, constipation, but no incontinence as we're thinking about the back pain and red flag signs of back pain um, and no skin rashes um, and for his neurologic exam, the weakness, but he doesn't have any gait problems or numbness again with the back pain, um, something that I thought about as well that may be important. And importantly, no lymphadenopathy, and he's immunocompromised. So for his history, the heart transplant, as we touched on, but also he does have this history of renal cell carcinoma. Um, he had a nephrectomy. We don't know how long ago, but I think his history of malignancy is also something important to think through. Um, his uh, social history, he has nine dogs, and they give me the information that they're dewormed, which is um, as I'm thinking through this with the hunting trip and his exposure, he also has a horse to farm animals and a chicken. Um, parasites is obviously something I'm thinking of, but maybe less likely um, given that information that they are dewormed. Um, the chicken who's now deceased, we don't know how recently the chicken died. Is this important? Do the chicken have some sort of pathogen that passed along to the patient? Um, that's certainly possible. And we don't know what the chicken died from. Um, and he's a hunter um, and has not killed. And we know he just went on a recent hunting trip, but sounds like he didn't kill anything recently, didn't get anything recently. Um, so as we're thinking through some of those differentials, notably tularemia first came to my mind, that may be a little less likely. Um, and also that he eats rabbits, squirrels and deer, but at least he boils the meat prior. Um, I think importantly, he's never used illicit drugs or has been incarcerated or homeless or traveled outside of the country. So tuberculosis is another differential that I was thinking of right away, but maybe less likely, and we'll go through that. His medications, um, he's immunocompromised. He's on mycophenolate, he's on tacrolimus. He is on atovacone, presumably for PJP prophylaxis, and not Bactrim, which we'll go into, and then valgencyclovir. I don't see any steroids in his regimen, and I don't know if that was maybe intentionally left off or he's not on steroids, but he's only four months post-transplant. Um, so I think typically the steroids are on there, but I don't know if that was intentionally left off or not. The rest of his meds, I don't think are quite pertinent at this time. And then his vital signs, he's septic. Um, so right off the bat, we have three out of four stars criteria, and he does not have any mouth ulcers, as was negative as a review of the system. So again, thinking through some differentials already, viral things may be less likely, and no lymphadenopathy. Um, he has no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Um, he didn't have any chest pain as a review of system. So obviously endocarditis as we're thinking through some of the processes would be something to consider, um, but maybe less likely given those negative exam findings. And no hepatosplenomegaly as a history of cancer. Um, he also was recently on a hunting trip. So some other pathogens could come up, but that is negative. And then his MSK, he has multiple um, nodules um, in various areas. 
Um, but neurologically, despite his back pain, his shuffling gait, it looks like he has a normal gait. Um, so it does not seem that he has any impending um, red flag signs or um, emergent conditions, um, at least in his spinal cord right now, and no skin rashes. So his labs, as we go through them, um, his white count is not elevated. He's immunocompromised, so that's not maybe necessarily too surprising, but he does have a neutrophilia and no eosinophils. Um, his inflammatory markers are fairly elevated um, and his respiratory culture does not have any pathogens with that lung lesion we heard about. Um, and then blood cultures were negative um, times two. We don't know for how many days they, were, they haven't grown anything, but at least we know there's been no growth thus far with two cultures. His fungitillin is aspergillus were both negative um, and his AFE culture had no TB and his quantiferin cold also negative. Um, and then cryptohistoblasto were all negative as well. And then the CT scan, as we heard, we have a cavitary lung lesion. We have a fluid collection with septation, which makes me think abscess in the gluteus muscle. We also have one in the paraspinal muscle and the um, abdominal wall musculature. So multiple lower um, extremity abscesses. And then a left cerebellar enhancing lesion with edema. Again, presumably an abscess given what I'm seeing everywhere else that appears to be um, infectious um, in etiology, but we'll go through that. So to summarize, we have a 60 year old male with a heart transplant four months prior, renal cell carcinoma, status post and nephrectomy and an affinity for game meat who's presenting with acute onset of multiple muscle masses, fevers, a cough after a recent hunting trip. The exam's notable for three out of first SIRS. He has multiple subcutaneous nodules and his labs and imaging note elevated inflammatory markers, multiple fluid collections in the muscle, a cerebellar brain lesion and a posterior apical cavitary lung lesion. So as I thought through this, I wanted to figure out where, does, where do we think this started from? Um, we have three different areas to focus on. We have a lung lesion, a brain lesion and these muscle um, abscesses. So I started by going through cavitary lung lesion and um, the differential for this is obviously usually quite large, um, but I tried to break it down and keep it consistent among the various um, areas that we're gonna focus on. So um, for infectious etiologies, bacterial is um, a big one, right? We have a whole, whole host of bacterial pathogens that can do this. Um, we often think about anaerobic um, bacteria, which is often mixed, staph aureus, Klebsiella, um, Pseudomonas, Nocardia, Actinomyces, um, Mycobacterium TB, obviously, um, with the, especially with the apical cavitary lung lesion, and various fungal pathogens. Um, various parasites can do this. And then again, septic emboli from endocarditis. I touched on this already. I mean, he, he is a heart transplant patient, so he's certainly at increased risk of endocarditis. But right now we have maybe two minor due criteria and none, nothing else that's supporting endocarditis at this time. No murmurs, no other characteristic skin findings. He does have a fever. Again, he's at risk for it, but we have negative blood cultures as well. We, we're not given an echocardiogram, but I think that's less likely at this time. Lemire's, we don't have any evidence of sore throat or neck swelling. Um, so. I think that's a little less likely. We know he doesn't do IV drugs and he has no indwelling lines. Um, Non-infectious etiologies, um, nothing seems very likely right now. This again, with everything else going on that we know of with the elevated inflammatory markers um, and no chest pain and no shortness of breath PE seems unlikely. No other characteristic skin findings for vasculitis. Um, he does have a history of malignancy, but um, I, the acuity of this doesn't seem consistent with that. So myositis is the next area that we'll touch on, right? So we have multiple uh, muscle abscesses and he has myalgias. And by definition, myositis is just inflammation of the muscle. There's a, again, a whole host of different pathogens that can do this. Um, a long list of bacterial pathogens, um, very similar lists of fungal pathogens and parasitic pathogens as we just saw in the cavitary lung lesion and a, a various amount of viral pathogens as well. And then the non-infectious things that we often think about, dermatomyositis, usually you would see an elevated CPK with that, which we, as you recall, had a normal CPK. Um, inclusion body myositis, again, same thing, and the acuity doesn't seem to fit with all this. Um, we don't have any other evidence, findings, or history of any prior vascular diseases. Um, no drugs that seem to 
do this and then no other history of amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, and nothing that really supports that, at least at this time. Um, and so a subset of myositis is pyomyositis. It used to be called tropical myositis, pyomyositis because it was first identified in, in tropical countries and tropical areas of the globe, um, but it has increasingly been recognized in the temperate climates and that's occurring more in immunocompromised individuals. So organ, tra organ transplants, HIV, um, and by definition, this is an acute intramuscular bacterial infection, neither secondary to contiguous infection of the soft tissue or bone, nor due to penetrating trauma. So it's typically the result of hematogenous spreading, and it's most commonly due to staph aureus. When you have pyomyositis, there's often no other metastatic infections, um, and there's often no endocarditis, despite this being a bacteremia process. And usually you do not see regional lymphadenitis, which we do not have in our case. Um, the most frequent sites tend to occur in large muscles. So um, we'll go through some case reports and you'll see in, um, evidence in the pectoralis muscles, um, the lower extremities, so iliopsoas muscle, gluteal um, medius muscle, um, the psoas muscle, and the muscle enzymes are often normal. There's three different stages of pyomyositis. The first stage, is often overlooked because there's very, there may not be any pain at all. There may not be any fever. Um, they may have some swelling, um, but it's really nothing that anyone thinks much of. And if they often CT scan it at this stage, you won't identify the abscess. And then about a week, um, up to 21 days later, um, they'll have this progressive swelling that will become a nodule or fluctuance and it'll be more localized. Um, you may have some overlying um, warmth of the skin and they may at this point be presenting febrile. And this is when if you repeat image them, you will often see the abscess collection and then an IND can occur. And then the third stage is when they're septic, there's significant tenderness, there's fluctuance, they're at risk of metastatic abscesses and shock. And the mortality in this stage can often be up to 10%. So this is where our patient is presenting at this point in time. And then um, the, this came from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a nice table that I thought we could utilize to pull out the common pathogens for brain abscesses. Um, so they broke it down into um, different predisposing conditions. So our patient has a transplant. So some of the more common isolates that they find is aspergillus and candida, um, mucoralis, and then um, nocardio, toxoplasma, and then TB. And then from um, when it occurs as a result of hematogenous spread, um, where you find lung abscesses or other, other coexisting conditions. So in our patient, um, I pulled out Fusobacterium actinomyces, um, some other gram negatives, nocardia and streptococcus. So we look through each individual area um, that we're dealing with with this patient. And each, each broke down into various bacterial fungal pathogens. Um, and so I think um, we have a lot of information to support a bacterial process. Um, our patient's immunocompromised, the acuity of this occurring, multiple abscesses um, does support that this is possibly and most likely a bacterial process, but it also could be fungal. Um, again, he's immunocompromised. Um, they're known to cause cavitary lung lesions, but we have a lot of information against that as well right now. We have a negative fungitel a negative platelia, negative histo, blasto, and crypto. And viral, um, though it certainly can cause a diffuse myositis in the myalgias, it would be very unlikely to cause a discrete muscle abscess in a brain abscess. So I don't think we're dealing with a viral pathogen at this time. And then parasites, he certainly has several risk factors for parasites. Um, he's an avid hunter and um, eats his game meat and has plenty of contact with farm animals. But we were given an information that his dogs are treated um, he doesn't have an eosinophilia um, and he has not traveled outside the country. Um, so I don't think we're dealing with a parasite at this time. Um, rheumatologic causes certainly um, could be possible. We went through some of those, but he doesn't have any history of the same. He really doesn't have a lot of si other signs and symptoms that would uh, further support this. No purpura um, that would support a vasculitis or eye involvement or sinusitis. And then malignancy, again, is also something to consider. He has a history of renal cell carcinoma. Um, but again, the acuity, I think, makes this less likely. And I don't think it would explain these um, muscle abscesses. Um, we don't know what the brain lesion is. Certainly with the edema, it could be a metastatic lesion. Um, but it, in the cavitary lung lesion, um, 
I, possibly, but I, again, it's with everything else going on taken together, I think malignancy in a, um, would be less likely at this time. So I think we're gonna focus in on bacterial and fungal pathogens. And the way I broke it down was um, each cavitary lung lesion, um, I took the common bacterial and fungal pathogens um, for the cavitary lung lesion and the pyogenic um, myositis and then the brain abscesses. And so in the red circle here, we're looking at um, the common pathogens among the three of them, um, at least some of the ones that I'll talk about that I felt like were um, pretty consistent overall with the case and we'll go through them. So we have staph, strep, clostridium, grand negatives. Now he doesn't have any GI symptoms to support um, many of these gram negatives. Um, so we won't really go into those, but I think with the lack of any abdominal or GI symptoms, um, we don't have any history of any like known dental caries. Um, they didn't give me a good oral exam. Um, no recent dental surgeries. I think overall this is less likely, um, but we'll talk about nocardia, actinomyces, mycobacterium, fusobacterium, and some fungal pathogens. So tularemia, I have to talk about first. I think we have had so much information about his contact with rabbits. It's also an important holiday coming up. So I wanted to just touch on this. I know I didn't even mention it on any of, of my previous slides, um, but I had to mention, he went on a hunting trip. He's at risk of tips. We actually never got information about what season this occurred. People often hunt in the winter when they, there are not a lot of ticks, um, but we definitely didn't get any information about tick bites occurring. Um, of course, he could have come in contact with this by his um, contact with rabbits while he eats them, but he does boil them. He hasn't skinned them recently. Um, and he has, importantly, no lymphadenopathy and no ulcers. And tularemia will often present as an ulceroglandular um, ulcerative lesion with central eschar, and there's often tender lymphadenopathy. Um, cavitary lesions are not as likely um, in, when there's a pulmonary process from tularemia. So I don't think we're dealing with tularemia, but I definitely felt like we should touch on it. Now, Staph aureus, um, we know could do all of this. Um, it's quite aggressive. Um, it's the most common pathogen in pyomyositis, um, up to 70% of cases in temperate regions. I've seen um, some of the case reports in some of the literature I read was up to 100% of um, the pathogens that occur in the tropical regions are Staph aureus. Um, it's uh, often can be, and the pneumonia can be primary or result of hematogenous spread. And it, as mentioned, can definitely result in a brain abscess or a muscle abscess. Now, interestingly, when you just have a pyomyositis process with staph aureus, the blood cultures are only positive up to 35% of the time. And as you recall, our blood cultures were negative. I think in our situation, when you have such a disseminated process, at that point in time, I feel like you certainly should have seen some positive blood cultures from Staph aureus. If it was an isolated pyomyositis, I could understand how you could maybe not have positive blood cultures, but with all the other, um, with the lung lesion and the brain abscess, I think we should have probably seen that. But this is a case report of a patient with IgA nephropathy and a kidney transplant. Um, he had initially noted a small nodule um, that was imaged and the imaging was normal. And that nodule progressed and grew. And so they repeated the imaging about 10 days later. And now um, they noted an abscess and they were able to drain it. And it was positive for staph. Um, this was in his left pectoralis muscle. So they diagnosed pyomyositis due to staph aureus. And he had negative blood cultures, but that was his only lesion. And in this patient, um, there's a 64-year-old female um, on azathioprine for lupus. She had come in with neck and shoulder pain and had an initial CT without any abscess, um, but she continued to have progressive swelling. They thought a week later that maybe she had a DVT, so she had another CT scan done. And then at that time, they noted a diffuse extensive abscess in the pectoralis muscle, and that was also due to staph aureus. I certainly don't think we can completely rule it out without further um, diagnostic workup, but I think we do have some reason to believe it might be less likely. Now tuberculosis, I also feel like we were given a lot of information that it's most likely not tuberculosis, but I can't not talk about it, especially um, with the apical cavitary lung lesion. Um, and he's immunocompromised, um, which certainly puts this at high possibility for us. But we did get um, good information that he had a negative AFB culture. He had a negative um, TB gold test and no history of other risk factors um, for TB.
Um, and presumably, I mean, he just had a transplant too. So presumably he should have had a workup for TB prior to his transplant that assumingly was negative. So we don't feel, think that we were dealing with a latent TB process and this reactivated um, due to his immunosuppression. I think that would be very unlikely. Um, the acuity also, though, you could have disseminated disease present in days to months um, time period. But here's just to keep in mind, and I think it's important that you shouldn't um, exclude it off your differential, um, that tuberculosis, tuberculosis myositis does occur. Um, and especially in patients in endemic areas, um, this certainly is something that they have seen. Um, this is a case report of a, a kidney transplant patient. That patient had developed, um, they did not have pre-transplant um, TB testing. And so, um, they developed uh, post-transplant pulmonary TB after six months post-renal transplant. And then two and a half years later, had multiple abscesses, um, paraspinal, thigh, and arm muscles um, due to tuberculosis. They didn't complete a full treatment course, um, which was the problem. And so they, the TB reoccurred and caused a pyomyositis. So it can happen. But again, I think for all the reasons listed, less likely in our case. Now, nocardia. Um, so nocardia, to remind you all, is this filamentous acid-fast gram-positive organism. It's found widely in the environment, um, and you often uh, develop the infection through breathing in the spores. The risk of nocardia is as high as the first year post-transplant. But interestingly, there is a reduced risk of nocardia infections and in steroid sparing regimens. And again, we don't know if it was intentionally left off or this patient's really not on steroids for some reason, um, but that could make it less likely. Um, often primarily does occur in the lungs with cavitation and then it disseminates hematogenously. It frequently spreads to the CNS. Um, so this is definitely not uncommon to see up to 30% of the cases and it will often be asymptomatic when it's occurring in the CNS. And another interesting fact is that it can be seen more often in those that are on non-Bactrim TJP prophylaxis. So our patients on a topoclone and not Bactrim. And the blood cultures are often negative because this takes several days to grow, sometimes 15, 20 days. So the first is a case report of a female with lupus um, immunosuppressed on prednisone uh, that presented with an elevated inflammatory markers of fever and a cough. And on imaging, her CT chest had multiple cavitating nodules. And then a few days later, she developed back pain and they performed an MRI, which noted um, abscesses in her paraspinal left psoas muscle and right abdominal wall muscle and multiple rem enhancing lesions in her bilateral cerebellar and um, cer uh, cerebral areas of her brain. Nocardia wasn't diagnosed until 28 days later by PCR. This is another case report of a Another patient with lupus um, who had initially a pulmonary um, nocardial infection that then spread to the psoas abscess muscle. And then the third one is a patient that had um, CIDP um, on prednisone and azathioprine and had two weeks of thigh pain. Um, also, I think initial imaging was negative and then the thigh pain progressed and repeat image noted the abscess. Um, and they were uh, found to have pyomyositis and nocardia. And then this is the article alluding to the increased incidence of nocardia in those on atovaclone rather than TJP because nocardia is treated with um, Bactrim. So I think there's a lot of similarities in our patient. Um, and I think the um, course and the progression of lesions, I think could have, with the stable cough, he could have developed the nocardia um, pulmonary lesion that then spread um, to involve the muscle in the brain later. I think it fits a lot. And then he had negative blood cultures, which is not uncommon with nocardia. Um, and given his immunocompromised state and he's on a tovacone, I think we have a lot of information to support nocardia at this time. Fusarium also was common amongst all the different um, things that we had looked at. Um, and this can occur in immunocompetent individuals, um, but in the immunocompromised um, patient population, you will see um, skin, ab skin lesions, sometimes these deep abscesses, which um, could involve the muscle, brain abscesses, and pulmonary involvement. Um, and pulmonary involvement is more often seen with a disseminated um, fusarium infection, but often the fungitel is positive, and often the blood cultures are positive. Fusarium tends to grow fairly well in the blood, 
Um, this is more often seen in patients that are neutropenic and those with T cell de deficiencies. So our patient is not neutropenic. Um, so a little less likely for that reason. And then the skin lesions that you do see um, are these erythematous papular um, lesions with central necrosis in the extremities. They don't always have to be there, but this article also alludes to um, the presence of these lesions are um, typically there when it's disseminated and they often have um, positive blood cultures. So we do have some things to support this, um, but I think um, given the negative fungital blood cultures, he's not neutropenic, we don't have these characteristic skin lesions, I think this might be less likely. And then actinomyces, um, so it can be found in livestock, which I thought was important um, given our patient's exposure to um, farm animals. And it can disseminate to the brain, um, but less often does it go um, to the skin or deeper than the skin. Um, but it certainly can cause cavitary lung lesions. But more often, actinomyces is a chronic supportive infection. Um, so think these um, facial lesions with these sinus tracts and drainages. Um, often, um, a lot of literature in these case reports um, are post-GI um, surgeries or even um, I a couple case reports about um, females with IUDs and developing these chronic actinomyces infections. And these things are often not diagnosed for months after onset, um, but you'll see these sinus tracts or fistulas. Um, but again, I mean, this is, blood cultures will often be negative in this situation. And this is very often missed and it takes a while to get this diagnosed. Um, it can take a while to grow. Um, and then here's two case reports. One was an injection wound um, of, a, um, was like a Botox injection for a patient that ended up developing a sinus tract and later found to be actinomyces, but again, later was a couple months later. Um, and then this patient initially, I put it in here because they initially had four months of symptoms, um, really just a stable cough, some intermittent fevers. They were found to have a cavitary lung lesion um, after several months. So just pointing out again, the, the duration of time before this is often picked up. But they do note in this article that it can spread to the skin, muscle, liver, and brain. And then Canada. Um, so Canada is um, one article I read does say this is the most common cause of fungal myositis. Um, and the blood cultures can be negative in up to 50% of disseminated infections. Um, when Canada fungemia is present, um, it often involves the eyes. We know we always need to get ophthalmology involved, evaluate for chorioretinitis or end up Um, but it often spreads more to the kidneys and to the heart and to the liver rather than the brain and, um, and the muscle. And when it does spread to the brain, it most often involves the meninges. Um, so that doesn't appear to be consistent with our patient. There are sometimes um, often missed and overlooked, but early on in the course of disseminating Canada, you can see these erythematous pap papules on the skin. Um, that is um, the skin lesions that are involved when this occurs. Um, it can involve the muscle, but it's not common. And it, furthermore, in our patient, a negative um, beta D glucan or the fungital makes it less likely as this often has a, a fairly high sensitivity up to 80%. Um, and a high negative predictive value for Canada. Um, it's not very specific, but we have a negative fungital, so I think that definitely makes it a little less likely. Um, and pneumonia due to Canada is not very common. I did put this in here, um, again, just to be sure um, this is still something to think about with pyomyositis. Um, a 57-year-old male, he had alcoholic liver disease and diabetes. Um, originally, uh, they noted an abscess in his gluteal muscle. He was having pain in that area. Imaging revealed the abscess, and then he developed um, a hepatic abscesses and multiple perinephric abscesses. And these are usually micro abscesses that occur in the disseminated infection. And then aspergillus is the other um, fungal pathogen I wanted to touch on. Um, obviously, he's immunocompromised, so puts him at risk for this. Um, the stable cough that they alluded to could have indicated maybe a chronic or subacute cavitary aspergillosis. We don't know how long that cough was present. Um, but again, in, you know, he is not too far out from his transplant. Um, so presumably wasn't there before a transplant, although it could have occurred shortly after. But we have, again, a negative um, beta-D glucan and galactamine testing, again, makes um, aspirin, his best 
especially invasive aspergillus as, as we would be dealing with in this situation, I think a lot less likely. But um, these are a couple case reports where we have a patient with CLL um, who developed multiple brain abscesses and multiple muscle abscesses that involve the um, gluteus muscle, pectoralis muscle, the parietal lobe due to um, aspergillus. And this is another one where it started as a pulmonary lesion and spread to the iliopsoas. And in this situation, um, the placelia and fungital were positive. Um, so it's disseminated. Again, I feel like at this point in time in our patient, you should have seen those mean positive. Um, but in this situation, we had a, there was a patient um, who had previously had radiation for lung cancer. And in that um, area of their lung where they had radiation and there was cavitation that there was an aspergillomat that developed. Um, and that was the only thing the patient had. And in that situation, they had a negative serum, beta D, glucan, and galactum, man. Um, so I think that makes more sense to me than if our patient who is a disseminated process, again, we should have seen positive um, markers. And then I wanted to touch on streptococcus very briefly um, and clostridium as well next. Um, just it was on each slide and I think it's important to go over, but again, we don't have any oral, known oral dental caries, recent um, dental surgery. Um, that would be a reason for this. Um, certainly if there's some sort of skin pathogen from a micro trauma we weren't aware of possibly, but this progresses very um, acutely. Two to three days. I mean, often it's um, so invasive that um, the CK uh, is usually elevated. There should be bacteremia. Um, and these patients are at risk of compartment syndrome. Same with clostridium, but I did, we got the information that he, he had a dead chicken. Clostridium is a very uh, common lethal bacterial pathogen in chickens. Um, so I had to include it. But again, similar to strep, it would be a very progressive um, infection that would produce some gas gangrene um, due to the toxin production. So I don't think that we're dealing with that. So um, I think after all that, um, the most important thing we need to do is um, talk to our interventional radiology colleagues and our transplant surgery colleagues and have them work together and to determine how to drain these abscesses and then um, get a culture off the, the fluid because I think that's gonna really help us um, determine what our diagnosis is. I think certainly he warrants a BAL as well with the cavitary lung lesion, but we need to, to definitely manage him um, diagnose it with um, some sort of IND, but he needs the abscesses drain for source control as well. I think based on all that information, I have a suspicion that this is most likely nocardia. Um, staph aureus, again, I think is possible, but I don't think it would be a CPC case with staph aureus. Um, and again, I think with the blood cultures being negative, it makes it less likely. So I am very excited to hear what our guest lecturer has to say. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Vito. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we really enjoyed your thought process, which is very, very informative. Um, but without further ado, uh, I will reveal our case expert so we can get to the diagnosis. Our case expert is Dr. Nicole Visicelli. She is a transplant infectious disease physician and assistant professor of medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University. She obtained her medical degree at Virginia Commonwealth and completed both her residency in internal medicine and fellowship in infectious diseases at VCU in 2020. She then joined the faculty at VCU in August of 2020 amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, where she currently practices as a transplant infectious dis uh, diseases physician. Dr. Visicelli has special interests in the treatment of infections due to multi-drug resistant organisms, antimicrobial uh, anti stewardship, and invasive fungal infections in immunocompromised hosts. So without further ado, Dr. Visicelli. Thank you, Neha, and excellent job, Dr. Vito. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen. Um, okay. Um, and first I'd like to congratulate Dr. Vito. That was an amazing um, run through the differential diagnosis and your thought process there. Um, and I'll now go through our, um, our, what our thought process as we were going through this case, the key elements as well as the diagnosis itself. And so the key elements of the case, um, let me just fix this here. 
Um, so the, this patient underwent heart transplant four months prior to presentation, so fairly immunosuppressed this early out from transplant. They had a subacute presentation over three weeks, had a, a disseminated process with fever, multiple painful, enlarging nodular soft tissue, tissue muscle masses and abscess or abscesses with a single enhancing cerebellar mass lesion, as well as this lobular left upper lobe pulmonary opacity with cavitation. He did have a history of renal cell carcinoma and had significant outdoor exposures, including the um, hunting with a recent trip, as well as multiple animal exposures, and notably no significant risk factors for tuberculosis or travel exposure. He did have high inflammatory markers, markers but a normal white blood cell count, and negative fungal serum biomarkers, including a negative galactomannan, beta glucan crypto ant cryptoantigen, histoantigen, and blastoantigens, as well as negative blood cultures and a negative quantifiron gold, which was done prior to transplant. And so when we think about this case and the risk for infection after solid organ transplantation, it's important to consider the timing after consideration after transplant and then the level of immunosuppression at this time. So in the first month, um, the patients are highest risk for nosocomial and post-surgical infections. Um, but in this one to six month period is when patients are really at their peak immunosuppression and at their highest risk for opportunistic and reactivation of latent infections. And then later on, you see more community acquired infections in addition to ongoing risk of opportunistic and reactivation of latent infections, especially in scenarios where patients remain on high immunosuppression, such as for the treatment of acute rejection. And so our patient was in this category and therefore definitely at increased risk for opportunistic infections. And then when we think about the differential diagnosis of a brain abscess, um, the, um, and Dr. Vito had done a great overview among the different differential diagnosis for all elements of this infection. Um, but the, for a brain abscess in particular, the risk of organism for each organism is gonna be dependent on the predisposing condition. Um, and so in this case, the patient had known lung disease also and was immunocompromised. And that definitely narrows down the differential a little bit here. And then we, when we think of, on top of that, which of these organisms can also cause capitary pulmonary lesions, you can see some of your typical bacterial organisms that can present as pulmonary abscesses, um, as well as your atypical bacteria, including nocardia, tuberculosis, mycobacteria, and fungal organisms as well. Um, and then when on top of that, this patient also has the soft tissue and muscle involvement, and that can narrow down this list even further. And so when we look at those categories, the um, ones that remain, especially with negative blood cultures, take off a lot of your routine bacterial organisms. And what you're left with is nocardia, actinomyces, rhodococcus, especially with the, um, the animal exposure, as well as your fungal and mycobacterial organisms. And then when you think about the case with the risk factors, um, the patient really didn't have any risk factors for TB. Um, and then again, with the negative fungal biomarkers, I 100% agree that even though you can't, can definitely have an invasive fungal infection with negative fungal biomarkers with this disseminated disease, you would expect to see um, an elevated beta glucan or galactomannan in those instances. And in this, for the, those that you wouldn't get those positive results, the mucor and dermatiaceous molds, those are just exceedingly rare that that would be overall less likely. Um, to be the case. So the, um, our, my leading diagnosis in going through this would be nocardia from an infection standpoint. And the patient did undergo um, a fine needle aspiration from one of his um, subcutaneous intramuscular masses and was found to have this gram stain. Um, and you can see the beaded gram positive rods that are shown here. And so the diagnosis was um, nocardia seriosa georgica. So excellent job, Dr. Vito, you're correct on this one. <laughs> um, the, so I'll go through the um, case, nocardia a little bit further. Nocardia is an aerobic, partially acid fast filamentous branching rod that comes from the actinomycetaceae family. And there are over 40 species associated with human infection. 
Um, the most common causes of non-cutaneous infections are due to endocardi-endova complex, Fersenica, Seriosa georgica, and abscessus. Um, these are ubiquitous organisms found worldwide um, in soil, fresh and salt water, and decaying vegetation. So in our case, the, a person who has a lot of outdoor exposure is definitely at higher risk for nocardia infection. Inhalation is the most common portal of entry, although it can be transmitted through dire direct inoculation cutaneously as well as through ingestion as well. And the risk factors are primarily through defects in T cell mediated immunity. High dose systemic steroids is one of the largest risk factors for nocardia. The prevalence in solid organ transplant ranges from less than one to 3.5%, with the highest risk in heart and lung transplant recipients. And the risk is higher in situations where the immunosuppression is more intense. So in the setting of recent rejection treatment, high calcineurin inhibitor levels, recent CMV infections, as well as prolonged ICU stay. In hematopoietic stem cell transplant population, the prevalence ranges between 0.5 and 1.7%. Again, with the highest risk in the setting of graft versus host disease, CMV, hypogammaglobulinemia, where the immunosuppression breast state is higher. You can rarely see nocardia and HIV, and then as well as in, after receipt of alentezumab, rituximab, or TNF, anti-TNF alpha agents. There are several manifestations of nocardia, but the most common are cutaneous involvement, lung involvement, and intracranial involvement. You can have a primary superficial cutaneous infection, which is the most common presentation of immunocompetent hosts um, and um, without any other involvement. But in most instances, especially in our immunocompromised patients, pulmonary is going to be the primary site of infection. And this is, is prevalent in over 90% of cases. The presentation can range quite significantly from a more acute presentation to a much more chronic presentation. And on imaging, we'll most often see nodules um, and that can be cavitary, although you can have a wide variety of imaging findings, including consolidations, mass-like lesions that can mimic malignancy or fungal infections, as well as um, abscess or pleural effusion. And then extra pulmonary manifestations uh, are common in up to 50% of immunocompromised patients with brain involvement being the most common. And this is typically as a single or multiple brain abscess, but you can have meningitis, ventriculitis, or spinal abscess as well. And it's important to mention that over 40% can be asymptomatic with brain involvement. So it's important to always get brain imaging when you have a diagnosis of nocardia, preferably an MRI. And then the second most common um, site of involvement in, is the skin, which can be anywhere from cellulitis to nodules to mesotoma to abscess, and they can go deep into the muscle as in, seen in this patient. Um, and then you can get abscesses and involvement um, in a number of other places as well um, listed here. Disseminated disease, involves at least two non-contiguous organs. This is through hematogenous spread, more common in immunocompromised patients. And again, the skin and, and CNS are the most common sites of infection here. So the diagnosis is by isolation of the organism on culture from the suspected infection site. And the organism can be detected on gram or modified acid fasting. The growth is usually in three to five days, but can take up to 14 days to grow. And you can have positive blood cultures, but that is fairly uncommon. The, and then we importantly need the species identification to predict susceptibility and assist with treatment. And so, it often takes a while to have the susceptibilities return because of the time it takes for the organism to grow. And most labs do not do susceptibility testing for nocardia, so it has to be sent out. Um, and so the empiric therapy takes into account the species identification once it's available, as well as drug interactions, risk for side effects, as well as the severity of disease. And so Bactrim is considered the preferred agent of treatment, and there's no randomized controlled trials to guide us regarding nocardia treatment, but Bactrim is the agent that has been most studied and it is widely susceptible against most, although not all, or all species of nocardia um, and has very high tissue penetration. However, they've been 
there's been reports of over 50% mortality in cases with severe disease disseminated and intracranial involvement with Bactrim monotherapy. And therefore, until sensitivities are known, it's recommended to use a combination of therapy. And it's usually with a combination of Bactrim, imipenem, and or amikacin. Um, and then reduction of immunosuppression alongside the treatment is key. Um, this chart shows the variability and the susceptibility profile across species. Um, and you can, um, and so it is very important to get the species identification and this can help us with our empiric treatment. The, um, the as you can see here, the only drug that is susceptible against all species is linazolid, but we're often limited in our ability to use that because of the high risk for side effects, especially with prolonged use. Um, and while amikacin and Bactrim are susceptible against most isolates, they're not, not across all species. The treatment, as I said before, depends on the site of disease as well as the severity of disease. Um, for just stable pul pulmonary disease, you can do Bactrim alone, but for anything more severe, you, you should do a combination of agents up front. Um, if there is a contraindication for Amipenem, amicacin, or Bactrim, you can use linazolid up front, um, which has, um, especially while waiting for susceptibilities, or um, ceftriaxone or minocycline as well. And this is usually continued for two to six weeks until we have susceptibilities back as well as clinical improvement. And at that point, you can de-escalate and transition to oral therapy. And the course continues for a long time and for pulmonary infections, at least six months. And then for disseminated or cerebral disease, at least nine to 12 months. And so our patient did a, have cultures that ended up growing nocardia seriosa georgica. And he was initially treated with ibipenem, bactrim, and linazolid, and then transitioned to ceftriaxone, bactrim, linazolid once the species was identified. The susceptibilities returned three weeks later, and he was transitioned to ceftriaxone. Um, and you can see the results of that here. And then in clinic um, follow-up, all of his symptoms had resolved. He had said he, they actually all resolved within seven days while he was in the hospital. And then his repeat imaging showed resolution of all of the soft tissue intramuscular masses and improvement of the pulmonary and cerebral abscesses, although not completely resolved. And so we did trial transitioning him to oral Bactrim, but unfortunately he developed hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury requiring hospitalization. So now he was back on ceftriaxone. Um, and we're planning to do a minimum of 12 months for a disseminated infection with cerebral involvement. Any questions? And thank you very much for having me um, here today. Did they have to drain the uh, muscular abscesses or they just resolved with antibiotics? They all resolved with antibiotics. Amazing presentations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vito and Dr. Vesicelli. We appreciate it. Um, any questions from the audience or Niha, any comments, thoughts? I just wanted to thank both Dr. Vito and Dr. Visicelli. I know this is a, a big grand rounds presentation, but we all really, really enjoyed it. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. The residents responded, they all feel enriched. So thank <laughs> you all. Um, I don't see any more questions in here. I'm sure if anybody wants a copy of these PowerPoints or presentations, uh, please reach out to our speakers. Uh, very thoroughly done and uh, the recording will be available on the website. So uh, thank you, Niha, again, for uh, helping to organize this and put it all together. Really uh, wonderful work. So um, I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Vito, any last minute comments or thoughts? No, thank you again for having me. And thank you to Nicole for um, the overview. It was great. Thank you all so much. That's the end of our grand rounds. The um, CME code will be put in the chat box here. And uh, also just a reminder for the survey, will be active for 30 days to provide feedback to improve grand rounds for next year. So thank you all so much. Uh, we'll stick around if there are any questions in the chat for a few minutes, otherwise, uh, Hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.
Thank you.